At the Halifax, we're all working together to be there for you. Your money is safe in your account. However, people are using the coronavirus outbreak as an opportunity to try out new scams. Rest assured that we will never call, text or email you asking you to move money to another account. Neither will we ask you to share your login details. For more information and for tips on how you can protect yourself against fraudsters, visit halifax.co.uk forward slash security. So however you need us, at the Halifax, we're here to help. Welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. Today we are going to be exploring the sad case of the murder of 35-year-old Diane Jones in 1983. Sadly, her case has never been solved, but also has never been forgotten, and there has been a renewed effort to try and get her case solved by Suffolk Police. The circumstances in which Diane initially disappeared were strange and confusing. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. The small town of Coggishall is located in Essex, close to Colchester. It's a historic town which contains hundreds of listed buildings of historical importance, and still maintains its village feel to the point where some residents do refer to it as a village. Coggeshall is where 35-year-old Diane Jones lived with her husband, Robert Jones. Diane had worked as a social worker in the past, and had only been married to Robert for 11 months in 1983. Robert was a doctor and had his own GP surgery in the area. The marriage was still very recent, and for 41-year-old Robert, this was the third time that he had been married. By all accounts from the outside, Diane and Robert's marriage was good and there were no indications of any stresses and strains. The couple were stable and had their own house, a luxury home at Lee's farm, and they were also financially stable as Robert had his own surgery and his wage as a GP. To those that knew the couple well, however, it was clear that the marriage was not working out the way that they had hoped. Despite the short time that they had been married, it's reported that Diane and Robert had already been talking about divorce as July 1983 came around. Despite the fact that Diane and Robert had not been getting along, they still did go out together and they were still living together. On the 23rd of July 1983, Diane and Robert decided to go for a drink at a local pub in Coggeshall called The Woolpack. The landlord at the pub, Bill Hutchinson, would later state in a contemporary news article that the couple came in at about half nine that evening. They entered the pub with a new dog, a poodle that he hadn't seen with them before. The time has sometimes been reported as after 10pm in other sources. Bill explained that Diane ordered a half of bitter and sat on one of the stools at the bar. After the couple had been there for a while, Bill and the other pub customers watched as Diane fell backwards off the stool. A group of people who were sitting behind her helped her up off the floor. Some witnesses were said to have described Diane as looking drunk. At closing time at around 11pm that evening, it's reported that Diane refused to leave the pub, and it's said that she told Robert, I'm not going home with you, you will beat me up. Robert reportedly took the dog and Diane's handbag to the car and came back in to get Diane. She still refused to leave and witnesses including Bill Hutchinson and his wife Judith stated that Robert grabbed hold of his wife and lifted her up over his shoulder in what witnesses described as a fireman lift. The landlord went out to the car and saw that Diane got in and the couple then drove off. The days after this seemed to go without incident and the couple were quiet with Robert attending his surgery as usual. Nine days after the couple had been seen at the pub, Robert Jones went into the local police station and reported that his wife was missing. Robert explained that on the evening of the 23rd of July, after the couple had been at the pub, he drove the car back to their home. He said that Diane got out of the car outside the gate to their house. He said that she always preferred to do that as she didn't like to scratch her heels on the gravel. 
Robert said that he left Diane at the gates and then went to park the car. He said that it was the last time that he saw her, as when he returned, Diane was not there. She had not returned to the house since. It was on that day at the police station that Robert officially filed a missing persons report about his wife. There was no mention as to why he'd waited nine days to report her missing, as they did live together and it would have been evident that she had not returned within a day or so. I am unsure if Robert did give an explanation for this, however it's reported in the Aberdeen Press and Journal on the 5th of August that Bill Hutchinson, the pub landlord, explained that he was aware Diane had left before, but had always returned after a couple of days. The police took the case very seriously and understood that after nine days they had to begin the search immediately. It's reported that police set out to comb the area around the Joneses' farmhouse for any clues as to where Diane had gone. As she had last been seen at her home, it was the first place that detectives needed to check and rule out. Fifty policemen descended on Coggershall and began to search around the home and the surrounding areas. The search, which was led by Detective Superintendent Mike Ainsley, made use of tracker dogs and mounted police to try and track down Diane's scent and possibly her movements. The police were somewhat on the back foot, considering the length of time that had elapsed since her last sighting, and this certainly did hamper the investigation from the start. It was clear that Diane had left with what she had with her, and it was believed that she must have gone on foot as she didn't have access to the car. From the onset of the investigation, suspicion fell upon Robert in the press, and reportedly within the local community. The fact that he had taken so long to report his wife missing caused some to believe that he was hiding something, and it wasn't long before details of the struggling marriage hit the headlines. Robert addressed these accusations and issued a statement. This is reported in the Aberdeen Evening Express on the 5th of August. He stated, It's been agony with all these suspicions, but I have to stay here because I'm the only doctor left in the village while my partner is on holiday. Otherwise I would have got out of here and left the police to it. The police were hardly going to take my word that she's not here because of the traumatic history of the marriage. They want to exclude the possibility of her being here, either by accident or something nasty. I have agreed to them doing whatever they want on the premises. I think that has been very sensible and the police have treated me well. During this statement to the press, Robert also explained that Diane had been suffering from a drinking problem and had disappeared on a few other occasions, confirming what Bill Hutchinson had also said. Robert denied accusations that he was a Romeo, as some people in the village had reportedly stated. One piece of information that had previously not been known about Diane was also stated in the newspapers in early August. Robert explained that Diane had told him that she was two months pregnant shortly before her disappearance. This certainly added to Diane's vulnerability and made it even more crucial that the police find out where she was. In the next week, police began to follow up on several leads in relation to Diane's disappearance. Frogmen were brought in to comb the bodies of water in the area, including the River Blackwater that runs through the village. Divers were also using dinghies to search the water, as well as the banks to try and locate either Diane or any evidence that may be related to her. The couple's farmhouse was also forensically searched, and the police made their presence known by setting up a mobile incident room. One of the lines of inquiry that the police followed up on was the couple's blue Peugeot estate. This became of interest to police when they discovered that Robert had sold the car a week after Diane's disappearance. The car had been sold through an advert in the publication Exchange and Mart and had been reportedly published before Diane had gone missing. Robert, however, stated that he did not know who he'd sold the car to. Detective Superintendent Ainsley stated, We believe it was bought by a male person, possibly in the Chelmsford area. The registration number of the car, GHK823T, was published in the newspapers, and he appealed, We would like anyone who knows where the car is to contact the police. Following on from the appeal, it did not take long for the new owner of the car to come forward. A police spokesman stated, 
as a result of the publicity given following an appeal through the press and radio, the owner of the Peugeot has contacted the police. He has allowed us access to the vehicle and it will be examined. The police also examined another Peugeot belonging to Robert for forensic examination. This vehicle had been off the road following a crash. Robert was cooperating with the police and had been questioned for a number of hours about Diane's disappearance. This did not mean, however, that the situation was without problems, as the increasing media presence in his life was causing some problems at his home and his surgery. It's reported in the Newcastle Journal on the 9th of August that he had a confrontation outside his home where he demanded that members of the media get off his property. His secretary, who had been driving him around the village, also became angry with members of the press. The village of Coggeshall had never seen so much media interest, and it was beginning to cause problems within the community, as the local doctor struggled to get to appointments without being questioned by reporters. Detectives continued to follow up on other lines of inquiry, including trying to track down some of Diane's friends and former boyfriends, six of whom would later come forward. They were also appealing for witnesses who were at the pub that night. It was reported that police wanted to know more about the manner in which the couple left that evening. As Argus continued, detectives searched further areas both close to the couple's home and in the surroundings, including gravel pits and a pond close to the house. It's also reported that they seized 120 cassette tapes from the couple's home, most of which contained pre-recorded classical music. While it was known that this had been taken as evidence, the police did not provide any further information about what they believe some of these tapes may contain. Despite further interviews with Robert and a continued search for Diane, the police did not appear to be any closer to solving where she was or what had happened to her. They once again appealed to the public for anyone that may have been on foot or in a vehicle within the one mile radius between the pub and the Joneses' home to come forward with information. Crucially, they wanted anyone that may have seen something in the area between the times of 11.15pm and midnight on the 23rd of July. This was the important window of time when Robert said he dropped Diane at the gate and she disappeared. Many members of the local community had reportedly come forward with information, but they were yet to find a witness who saw Diane in that time frame aside from Robert. Police also released information that they believed that she was wearing a pink and mauve sundress made of a thin Indian-type cloth on the evening of her disappearance. The investigation in Coggeshall itself began to wind down towards the end of August, as many of the search areas had been checked without any success. At the end of August, the police got a tip that led them to the town of Bury St Edmunds, around 30 miles away from Coggeshall. The tip was called in by a woman claiming to be a close friend of Diane's, who knew that she was living in Bury St Edmunds. The caller said that she'd been in the US for the past six weeks, but would not give any further information about herself. The police did take the call seriously and hoped that this information was correct, as it would mean that Diane was alive and well. Throughout September 1983, however, no new information surfaced, and sadly the hope that Diane would be found alive began to fade. As September turned into October, she had been missing for two months without any contact with friends, and it was a concern for all that knew her. On the 22nd of October 1983, however, a discovery was made that changed the investigation completely. A man who had been at a pheasant shoe in the village of Brightwell in Suffolk came across the badly decomposed body of a woman adjacent to the A1093 road close to Martlesham. Suffolk police immediately came out to the scene and it was apparent that it was the body of a woman in her thirties. The area was around 32 miles away from Coggeshall and the possible connection between the body of the woman and Diane Jones was quickly established. Detectives from Essex police travelled to Suffolk to join the investigation and initially a positive identification could not be made. Upon further investigation it appeared that the body had been in the undergrowth for around 12 weeks, which did appear to match the length of time that Diane had been missing. 
Just two days later, after forensic and dental examinations of the body, it was confirmed that the woman was Diane Jones. Chief Superintendent Eric Shields from Suffolk CID stated to the press, Following a full scientific investigation, I am now able to confirm that the body found at Brightwell on Saturday was that of Diane Jones, who has been missing since July the 23rd. The examination of Diane's body had found that she had died due to head injuries. The missing person's inquiry was now a murder investigation. It had been established that Diane had most probably been murdered on the night that she had disappeared. All eyes turned back to Coggeshall and the home that Diane and Robert shared. If she had been murdered on the night that she disappeared, where had this happened? And had someone seen something that night that might help? Police again appealed for witnesses in Coggeshall who may have seen something to come forward, and they also questioned people in the area of Brightwell where her body was found. A number of items were removed from Dr Jones's house including the 15 feet front gate. The inquiry was clearly focused upon the family home and the area around it, leading many to believe that the police may have more evidence. In the middle of November, this seemed to have been confirmed when it was reported that three people had been arrested for Diane's murder. A police spokesman at the time stated that two men and a woman had been arrested in connection with the murder, but would not give out any more information. It was later discovered that the three people arrested were Robert, Diane's husband, a man called Paul, who was a friend of Diane's, and Robert's second wife, Sue, who worked for him at the surgery as a receptionist. The three people were questioned by police for two days, before being released on bail. While Robert was in prison, police took the opportunity to search the house and garden using metal detectors. News of the arrests ramped up the media speculation surrounding Robert Jones and stories began to emerge in the papers about his possible affair with a 21-year-old woman. He denied this, saying that the woman was only a friend and nothing more. He also stated he believed police were wiretapping his phones and that they had spread the rumour about him to the newspapers. Further headlines came out about Robert's subsequent arrest for drink driving an offence which had taken place in August 1983. He was found to be driving on the wrong side of the road and was found in the back of his car by police. When he got out of the car, he was staggering and smelt strongly of alcohol. He admitted to having six pints and knowing that he was over the limit. In court, he stated that he had been under intense personal pressure following his wife's disappearance. He said, the circumstances in which I found myself at the time were unique in my experience. People from newspapers were knocking on my door, which was very distressing. He was found guilty of the offence, was charged £100 and disqualified from driving for 12 months. The coverage of his supposed affair and the drink driving offence almost hid the news that police were still trawling the area where Diane's body was found to try and find the murder weapon which they now believed may have been a claw hammer. Over the next few months, and as 1983 turned into 1984, detectives were no closer to discovering any new evidence. In April 1984, it was announced that no further action would be taken against Robert Jones in relation to his wife's murder. In that same month, the inquiry into her death was carried out. The verdict of murder by person or persons unknown was recorded by the coroner. Home Office consultant Professor Austin Gresham stated that Diane had four depressed fractures to her skull, which were thought to have been caused by a Tyler's hammer. He ruled out strangulation as the cause of death as the bones in her neck were intact. The coroner explained that it was not possible to determine where Diane had been murdered. Detectives from Suffolk CID explained that inquiries were still ongoing in her case. The weapon had still not been discovered. This ruling further established that Diane had indeed been murdered and that her body had clearly been dumped in that area in the hope that she would not be found. The absence of a murder weapon and a crime scene, however, made it difficult to indicate a suspect. As the police had now cleared Robert, they were back at square one 
and sadly this meant that the investigation began to come to a halt. Throughout the rest of the 1980s, no new evidence emerged to help find out who murdered Diane Jones. In 1990, an inquiry into Diane's case was reopened after Essex Police once again liaised with Suffolk Police. It's reported that during this reinvestigation, Robert was once again spoken to about his connection with the murder, due to what the East Anglian Daily Times states was fresh evidence. Nothing more, however, came from these interviews, and Robert was once again not charged with anything. Sadly, since then, no new evidence or fresh investigations have led to any more arrests, and Diane's case remains one of the most infamous unsolved cases in Suffolk. So what happened to Diane that night? It's clear that Robert was and should have been a suspect from the outset of the investigation. He was the last person to see Diane, and it is his account that the police were relying on to try and trace her last movements. They did not have a stable marriage, and it's clear that the couple had had some sort of argument, either in the pub or before they went to the pub. It's also suspicious that Diane disappeared from right outside her home, and it took Robert nine days to report her disappearance. The fact that she was also two months pregnant probably added to the pressure of this already difficult marriage. It's important to say that no evidence has been found that links Robert to his wife's murder and he's been cleared of any connection to it. The fact that the couple were having problems in their marriage and were having arguments could describe many people's situations and it's not fair to judge him as a suspect purely on these facts alone. We do not know if Diane had decided to walk off that evening and perhaps got herself into some trouble along the way, possibly meeting someone who might have wanted to harm her. The facts however do show that she was murdered sometime that evening after leaving the pub, and that she had most probably been hit over the head with something resembling a claw hammer. The suspect most probably had a car in order to transport Diane's body to that location. The attack was brutal, and the awful fact is whoever committed this crime got away with it, and was still on the loose after it happened. Having read many newspaper articles about this case, I have to say I was quite disheartened by the way that Diane's disappearance and murder were reported on. Many of the articles did not place Diane at the centre of the story, and in fact focused much more on Robert and the many rumours surrounding his love life. While I have included some of this speculation in today's episode, to help paint a picture of the media frenzy surrounding the case, I was astounded that so many articles did not treat Diane with the respect she deserved, even discussing what they described as her numerous ex-boyfriends. Diane was the victim in this case, and that should be remembered. Her killer has never been brought to justice, and tragically she met her death on a lonely piece of woodland. This is something she certainly didn't deserve. Appeals have been made over the years for further information, but sadly nothing credible has been found. Diane's case is up on the Suffolk Constabulary website where they appeal for anyone to come forward with new information as the case is periodically reviewed. On the website it states, There may also be witnesses who might, for a number of reasons, have been unable or unwilling to provide police with information they hold. With the passage of time, those witnesses may now be in a better position to come forward in order to assist. I certainly agree with this statement, and I really do hope it's true. If you know anything about the murder of Diane Jones in 1983, please contact Suffolk Constabulary and the major crime review manager Andy Guy directly at unsolvedcasereviews at norfolk.pnn.police.uk. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I just want to point you in the direction of another great UK podcast that has also done an episode about Diane's case. Jess, over at Outlines, covered this case and does amazing research, even going out to the area where the crime happened. I would highly recommend checking it out if you're interested in learning more about the case. Let me know what you think about today's episode on social media by following the podcast on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. You can further support the podcast by subscribing to our new YouTube channel where I upload recent episodes or reviewing the podcast wherever you listen. Thanks to our recent five-star reviewer from the US, Strick and Soda. 
Thank you as always to our Patreon supporters. You make these weekly episodes possible. Thank you to our amazing new patrons, Wendy and Barbara. Your support is much appreciated. If you want to support us on Patreon and get goodies, shoutouts and bonus episodes, the link is in the show notes. If you want to suggest a case that you want me to cover on the podcast, you can contact me on social media or at theunseenpod at gmail.com. Next week's episode has actually been voted for by patrons, so I hope you'll be listening to that one. As always, thanks for listening. I'm Caprice, and this has been Unseen. At the Halifax, we're all working together to be there for you. Your money is safe in your account. However, people are using the coronavirus outbreak as an opportunity to try out new scams. Rest assured that we will never call, text or email you asking you to move money to another account. Neither will we ask you to share your login details. For more information and for tips on how you can protect yourself against fraudsters, visit halifax.co.uk forward slash security. So however you need us, at the Halifax, we're, we're here, here to help. help.